Hello, future RM2s. Welcome to the first lecture about introduction to clinical parasitology. For our learning outcomes, our objectives for today is to differentiate the types of biological relationships, host vector interaction, mode of trans infections or transmission, prevention of different parasitic infections, and of course, for you to identify the appropriate sample in detecting parasites. And for the overview, we're going to discuss the groups of parasites, okay? the immunologic, uh, immunology of parasitic infections, the host parasite relationship, and what are the general consideration in terms of parasitology. Interestingly to know that uh, parasitology or when you said parasitic infection, it, rep it represents to 50%. No? Parasitic infection, okay, represents 50% or even more than 50% of the diseases listed in the neglected tropical diseases. Okay, 50% of neglected tropical diseases or NTDs is parasitic infection. Okay, now uh, research shows that helminths and protozoans are among those agents that causes parasitic infection. Okay, as a matter of fact, in Asian countries, which includes the Philippines, you know, uh, NTDs is one of the concern. But if we are going to take a look with the name itself, neglected, okay, meaning to say the health status or the attention of the health sector is not that high. Okay, that is the reason why uh, most of the parasitic infections are being neglected. Like for example, Elephantiasis caused by filaria is endemic in some places here in the Philippines. But but uh, Filipinos, most especially those who are in a poor uh, rural area, don't have the access for appropriate medication. That's why it's being neglected. Okay. So that's based on the WHO record, okay? Remember, NTDs draws attention among health clusters, primarily because of its public health impact. Okay, now we cannot uh, eliminate the relationship of neglected tropical diseases to poor health policy. It is also correlated in poverty. Okay. Now, the extensive efforts were already made at the, some level or some community. However, it is not the same. That's why it's important for us to just to discuss. Okay, what is this parasitology is all about? Now, when we said parasitology, no. This is an area of biology, an area of science, wherein it is concerned with the phenomenon of dependence. When we said phenomenon of dependence, it is where an organism depends its whole life to other organism. And that is primarily the parasite. As we discuss in our orientation, parasitology deals with the study of parasites. So the parasite itself is the focus, not only the parasite, but also the uh, relationship of parasite to the host, how the host acquire the infection, how to eliminate the infection. You know? Those are the areas concerned by clinical or medical parasitology or parasitology. Okay? In other words, we can say that parasitology is a scientific study of parasite and, on, and 
uh, the organism that it depends. The host and the organism that provides the shelter and nourishment to the parasite. Well, that's the purpose of the host. That's the relationship. The, 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 the purpose or the role of the host to the parasite is providing nourishment, providing environment, providing the continuity of the life cycle of the parasite. Again, without the host, parasite is nothing. Now we have what we call medical parasitology. And what is medical parasitology is all about? That is also a branch of parasitology that is under uh, what you call this? That is under the auspice of parasitology. And then you said medical or clinical parasitology, it is concerned with the parasites that has or that is clinically significant or medically significant to human. Okay? It deals on the animal parasites of the human and their medical importance. Not only the medical importance, but also the public health importance. Or in other words, the public health impact. Okay? Now, like what I've said, uh, parasitology is the study of the phenomenon of, independ of dependence. No? Being dependent to one another. That's why we have what we call biological relationships. These biological relationships will give us an idea of what are the relationships present in parasite and its host. Okay? So when we said symbiosis, it is basically uh, living together of unlike an organism. They are totally different. No? It involves protection or other advantages to one or both. Okay? And symbiosis, no? it can be commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. Okay? Then yung mga different types of biological relationships, right? We have the commensalism, we have the parasitism, and we have the mutualism. Now, you are all familiar with this. As you discussed this in your general science course when you were in junior high school or even in senior high school. But what is this all about? When we said commensalism, these are two living organisms that live together. The other is benefited while the other is not. Even though that the other is benefited and the other is not, there is no harm produced to the other organism. Okay? If you still remember, I said that most of the amoebas are commensal amoebas. They are inside our human body or they are inside our intestine. They are being nourished by the nutrients uh, that we eat. But they don't cause harm. That is an example of a commensal parasitism or commensalism. However, there are cases that entamoeba coli also cause diarrhea or even amebiasis. This is a condition wherein the human or the host himself or herself has a weak or low immunity, which allows no, the virulence of the entamoeba coli to cause infection. On the other hand, we have what we call the mutualism. Mutualism is a symbiotic relationship wherein two living organisms are benefited from one another. Example of which is the termites and flagellates in the digestive system. Okay? They are both benefited to one another. And of course, the focus of this discussion is all about the parasitism. Okay? When we said parasitism, the one is benefited while the other is not. Okay? One is benefited while the other is harmed. In commensalism, one is benefited, the other is not harmed. But in parasitism, 
one is benefited, the other is on harm. Merong danger. Merong nangyayari. And that is mainly because of the parasites. And when we said parasites, it depends its survival at the expense of its host. No? Remember, parasites depends its survival at the expense of its host. However, there are other parasites that uh, that uh, does not require host. Facultative parasites. However, when we said facultative parasites, as we go as we are going to discuss it also as we go on, facultative parasites, sila yung ano, they are the type of parasites that can live with or without the host. However, it is essential for their development. It is essential for their survival to have the presence of the host. Because without the host, pwedeng there will be a continuity, but low uh, number of nourishment. Okay, there are types of parasites. No, there are types of parasites which we are going to discuss. No? Now remember also that uh, parasites is described according to their habitat. In amoebas, we have what we call intestinal parasites. It's very clear from the word itself, intestinal, their habitat is in the intestine. Now, the, uh, no. you have no questions na about that. If you were asked, and amoeba coli, being an intestinal parasite, resides in what organ? Intestine. Can be seen in what organ? Intestine. We also have what we call extra-intestinal amoebas. And when we said extra-intestinal amoebas, outside the intestine. Example of which is Negleria cholerae. Because Negleria cholerae, being a in extra-intestinal parasites, invades the CNS or the central nervous system. That is an amoeba. But it can be described based on their habitat. That's why we have extra-intestinal and intestinal parasites. Okay. Yeah, this is what uh, this is also similar to our explanation of well, depends on the other organism. And they are considered erratic. No? They are considered erratic. Pag po sinabi natin erratic, what does it mean? Hindi mo maintindihan. Kalipat-lipat siya. Pabago-bago. Okay? Example of which is our uh, helminths. Most of the helminths are erratic. Example, Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascaris lumbricoides is the giant intestinal roundworm. From the word itself or from the name itself, giant intestinal roundworm, it is clear that Ascaris lumbricoides is in the intestine. However, Ascaris lumbricoides can be seen in other organs. Heart, maybe. Lungs, maybe. Kasi erratic siya. Pabago-bago. Palipat-lipat. Okay? So those are the parasites. Now, like what I've said, there are classifications of parasites. Okay? And, and, and parasites are classified into two. No? According to the relationship between the host and the parasite and according to the habitat. Okay. So let me discuss it thoroughly. Let me just share my black screen. Okay. Like what I've said, parasites can be classified or there are two types of parasites. According types of parasites. Okay, number one is according to the relationship. According to relationship to host, to its host. And the other one is according to its habitat. Okay, if according to the relationship, that will be our obligate parasite. Okay. 
that will be our facultative parasite. That is our uh, temporary or transient parasite. We also have the intermediate, uh, intermittent, sorry, intermittent, intermittent parasite. Okay. We also have our, according to its host, a uh, habitat rather, according to its habitat, therefore we have the endoparasite, endoparasite, and of course, the ectoparasite. Now, what is the difference between this? It's very clear. According to relationship, how, uh, what is the relationship of the parasite to the host? Okay. And have habitat, endo or ecto. When you said endo, no, uh, endoparasites live within the host. No, when we said ectoparasites found on the surface of the body. Okay, so that is the the the, the next slide that we are going to discuss. Again, when we said endoparasites, these are the parasites that live inside the body. Ascaris nubricoides, Trichuris trichuria, uh, Mecator americanus, Entamoeba histolytica, Georgia lambia are examples of endoparasites. And the disease caused by these endoparasites is what we call infection. Therefore, the infection caused by Ascaris lumbricoides is what we call ascariasis. Ascariasis. The infection caused by uh, entamoeba histolytica is called as amoebiasis. Okay, that is infection caused by endoparasites. Endoparasites live inside the human body. On the other way, or on the other hand, we have what we call ectoparasites. And when we said ectoparasites, these are parasites that live outside the body of the host. And usually these are what we call the arthropods. Infestation. Infestation of the fleas. Something like that. Okay. This is the purpose or is the target no, of ectoparasites. Now remember guys, the essence of parasitic relationship no, separates it from predation. Okay. It is protected and intimate association between the parasite and the host. Okay. So this is the classification or the types of parasite based on its habitat. Now the other types is according to its relationship to its host. Number one is we have the obligate parasites. No problem, the word is obligate. It requires host to complete life cycle. Example of which is the plasmodium species. Do you know that plasmodium species requires two hosts? One intermediate host and one definitive host. Because the life cycle of plasmodium or the malarial species, so the life cycle of plasmodium begins with the ingestion of blood from infected human. Then the mosquito, which serves as its uh, definite, uh, intermediate host, oh, no, no, definitive host, no? allows the uh, reproduction or allows the con continuity of the life cycle. Now, the sporocytes that is produced by the mosquito during the, con the continuity of the life cycle of plasmodium will be injected to human so that there will be the production or the sporocytes, you know, the sporozoites, I'm sorry, the sporozoites, the infective stage to human. Could you imagine if there is no human present? You know, the sexual phase is not possible. Another example of a obligate parasite is the tapeworm. That's a good example. Tapeworm depends entirely to the host. 
tapeworms are what we call the cestodes. Now, these are what we call cestodes. Bakit po siya tinawag the tapeworm? It because it resembles tape being a flat. That's why tapeworms or cestodes is also known as the flatworm. However, sometimes flatworms can be referred also to trematodes because they are also flat. And the difference between trematodes and uh, tapeworms or cestodes is that cestodes resembles a tape. They are flat no? and uh, they are thinner no? as compared to trematodes, which resembles leaf-like. Now, having said that uh, cestodes depends entirely to its host, that's correct. No? Cestodes cannot live without their host. Example of which, uh, Tenia saginata. No? Tenia saginata. Tenia saginata is uh, a cestode, a tapeworm. Okay? And the intermediate host of Tenia saginata is the beef. I don't know, I'm sorry, the cow. No, cow, not beef. Because beef is part of the cow. Beef is the mode of transmission, ingestion of beef. Okay. Cow allows the continuity of the life cycle. Later, we're going to discuss what do we mean by intermediate host? What do we mean by definitive host? So that you will understand what is the relationship of Tenia saginata to its host. Why Tenia saginata being a cestode cannot survive without the host. Okay? Now, when we said facultative parasite, free living parasite, no? These are organisms that may exist in a free living state or as a commensal state. However, if there is an opportunity for them to have the host, it is essential for their living. Then it becomes what we call parasitic infection. Next in line is we have the accidental or incidental host. What is the difference between uh, accidental and permanent host? When you said accidental host, parasites, with, parasites which establish itself in a host where it does not ordinarily. Example, a uh, Hemenolatis nena. We are an accidental host of Hemenolatis nena. Okay. Accidental or incidental. Now we also have what we call temporary. What is temporary parasite? These are parasites that are obligatory at one or more stages of their life cycle, but they are free living at others. Transient. Okay. And we have what we call the permanent parasite. Permanent parasite remains on the body of the host for its entire life. Do you know, guys, that once you have uh, entamoeba histolytica in your lumen, it will reside permanently into your lumen. Okay, so temporary parasites, again, these are parasites that live in their host only for a short period of time. Transient, in other words. How about spurious parasites? Spurious parasites are free living parasites or organisms that passes through the digestive tract without infecting the host. The difference between spurious parasite is that the spurious parasite and facultative. Facultative, again, no, facultative again, they are there. No, they can live without the, para the host. They are also free living, like spurious parasites. However, facultative parasites, kapag meron silang opportunity to invade the host, they can cause parasitic infection. While spurious parasites are just there. 
prelevin, but one day, once they pass the digestive tract, they will just pass without causing an infection to the human. Now, like what I've said, it is important for us to discuss this type of host because you will understand na. Ibig sabihin ng host. What is the purpose of host? Why host is important in this field of parasitology? Let's start it with definitive host. When we said definitive host, it is usually called as the final host, wherein the parasite attains the sexual maturity in the definitive host. Okay? Humans is always considered as the, the definitive host. Again, when we said definitive host, this is a type of host in which the adult sexual reproduction takes place. Okay? The sexual reproduction takes place. And usually, we as humans are considered as definitive host. On the other hand, we have what we call the intermediate host. Intermediate host is defined as the uh, host which allows the asexual phase or the larval stage of the parasite. All right? Cestodes and trematodes, these are the examples of parasites. Ano nga sila? Obligate parasites. They require the host. And this two class of parasite depends greatly on their intermediate host. As, a, as the example given a while ago, pig or swine, is the intermediate host of cestodes, uh, of tenuous ad solium, rather. I'm sorry. Cattle or cow is the intermediate host of tenuous aginata. Snail is the intermediate host of Schistosoma japonicum. The snail is also considered, or mollux, no? Mollux is considered as the intermediate host of all Trematodes. However, trematodes, having said, requires two intermediate hosts, except for blood dwelling trematodes, which is your Schistosoma species. I will repeat. No? Trematodes being a being a obligate parasite depends mainly or greatly on their intermediate host. Intermediate host is a type of host. Which allows now which allows you now the continuity of the life cycle, particularly the asexual phase or the larval stage of the parasite. Trematode requires two intermediate hosts. The first intermediate host of trematode is snail. The second intermediate host of trematode is dependent on the type or, or, or on the specific genus of the trematodes. Let's say, for example, Pashola hepatica. So, Pashola hepatica, the first intermediate host of Pashola hepatica is the snail. The second intermediate host of that is vegetation. Another example is. Uh, Schistosoma japonicum. The first intermediate host of Schistosoma japonicum is a snail. Thus, it requires another intermediate host only. It might be confusing to you, but we're going there. Just remember, trematodes requires two intermediate hosts, except for schistosoma. Okay? Now, how about paratenic host? When we said paratenic host, these are, uh, the parasites does not develop further to later stages. Parasites remain alive and cannot infect. 
Okay? Example of which is Paragonimus westermani in wild boars. Wild boars, just alam mo, parasite, Paragonimus westermani, the causative agent of what we call oriental lung fluke. No? Oriental lung fluke. The intermediate host of Paragonimus westermani, the first intermediate host, is snail. The second intermediate host is crabs or crayfish. But wild boars no, serves as the paratenic host. Ano again? When we said paratenic host, parasites remain alive and can infect. Nandun lang sila. But once these wild boars were, I was eaten by the other, then that's the time that they can infect. Who about reservoir? Reservoir host allows the parasite life cycle, life cycle to continue and becomes additional source of infection. Example, pig as the reservoir host of Balantidium coli. Rats as the reservoir host of Paragonimus lastermani. Cat as the reservoir host of Brugia malai, a filaria that can cause the elephantiasis in the upper extremities. Okay. Vectors is different from host. Host on the host. Huh? Kapag sinabi natin host, no, an organism where an organism where the parasite depends. And when we said vectors, these are the one responsible for transmitting the parasite from one organism to another, from one host to another. Mostly, vectors are the insects, mosquitoes, fleas, flies. They are vectors. Okay? There are what we call different, uh, two types of vector. We have the biologic vector and we have the mechanical vector. So what is the difference between biologic vector and mechanical vector? That's basically this way. When we said biologic vector, these are the types of vector that transmit the parasite only after he later has completed the life cycle within the host. Okay? Ibig sabihin, this biologic vector is also part of the life cycle of the parasite. Thus, it is called essential part of the parasite's life cycle. Again, biologic vector transfer the parasite from one host to another. Ito yung infected host. no? Infected host. We have here the vector. This vector will transmit the parasite to the other host. Okay? But before this vector transmit the parasite to other host, this vector allows first the parasite to continue the life cycle. Example of which is Aedes or Aedes. Metrophilariasis. Anophilus. For uh, Plasmodium. Okay. That's biologic vector. How about mechanical or uh, poretic vector? When we said mechanical or poretic vector, they just transmit parasite and they are not part of the life cycle. They just transmit parasite and they are not part of the life cycle. Example, flies and cockroaches. Flies and cockroaches can be a vector of Ascaris, can be a vector of Entamoeba can be a vector of hookworm. They are not part of the life cycle. They are not essential part of the life cycle. But they become important in transmitting the infection. Let's put it in this way. I am the teacher. Okay? I am a biologic vector. In order for you to have the information, I have to process it before giving it to you. Mechanical, I'm just allowing you to, I'll just pass it to you without doing nothing. 
to the lesson itself. Okay, that is a vector. Now, how about carrier and exposure? When we said carrier, it harbors a particular pathogen without manifesting any signs and symptoms. You have you are asymptomatic. No, you are asymptomatic. You are already exposed to the parasite, but you don't manifest any signs and symptoms about the parasite. When we said exposure naman, the process of inoculating an infective agent. Okay? Ito yung na-expose ka. Na-expose ka. And the parasite is on the process of infecting you. Infecting the host. Okay? And when we said infection, infection is a uh, connotes the establishment of the infective agent. Exposure, you are exposed. Infection, the establishment of the infection or the establishment of the disease, the establishment of the uh, manifestations of signs and symptoms is already seen to you as the. Now, how about incubation period? Incubation period is the time wherein you are exposed until the time you have an evidence of symptoms of the infection. Usually, no, incubation period is also known as the clinical incubation. Okay. Ulitin natin. Uh, alam ko, nakunot na yung noo mo dyan. Uulitin natin. Again, carrier, you have the parasite. No signs and symptoms. But you have the parasite. Exposure, you are exposed to the parasite and the parasite is on the process you know, of, of establishing the infective agent to you or infective stage to you. When we said infection, you manifest already the infective stage, the infective agent of the parasite. You have the clinical signs and symptoms. When we said incubation period, from exposure to the manifestation of signs and symptoms, that is your incubation period. Let's say, for example, before, before you manifest an infection of entamoeba histolytica, there is what we call 7 to 14 days of incubation period. Before entamoeba histolytica is capable to uh, cause an infection to you. Now, what are the signs and symptoms associated with parasitic infection? Like what I've said a while ago, okay? Parasites can be classified as intraintestinal or extraintestinal. But most of our parasites invades the gastrointestinal tract, being said to be intestinal parasites. Most of our parasites are intestinal parasites. And being intestinal parasites, the most common mode of transmission is ingestion of a food contaminated with the infective stage of the parasite. Having said that the, the most common mode of transmission is ingestion, and the most common parasite is intestinal parasite. Take note that diarrhea and abdominal pain are the most symptoms associated with parasitic infections. Most of our parasites will cause you diarrhea. It's the most common eh? symptoms associated with parasitic infection. You will have a diarrhea. Why will cause? Why will you have or why you will experience diarrhea? That is because of the strain inoculated by the by the parasite in your gastrointestinal tract. Later, no, or in the next part or on the next part of this video, I'm going to discuss the, the immunology, how the parasite caused an infection. Okay. Aside from that, fevers and chills. Why there is a fever? It's because of the infection caused by the parasite. Your, uh, our, our WBC is starting to react with this parasite. Starting to react to the virulence of the parasites. Which will cause interference to increase and cause hyperthermia. Or what we call increase in body temperature. Elephantiasis is actually 
a symptoms of a parasite wherein there is an enlargement of the lower extremities. Why there is an enlargement of the lower extremities? Because of the parasite blocks the lymph nodes. Blocks no? the, uh, what do you call this? The nodes. That's why the extremity swells. Okay, lumalaki. Anemia. Hookworm can cause anemia. Okay, blood loss. Kasi nagkakamaroon ka ng blood loss. Dithylobotrium latum. Okay, a cestode can also cause anemia. We have what we call hypo, uh, hypochromic anemia. We also have what we call vitamin B12 deficiency anemia or megaloblastic anemia. That is caused by a parasite because of the origin is a blood loss. Vitamin deficiency is also possible. Bowel obstruction. Bowel obstruction can be seen in any different type of parasite. Best example is Ascaris lumbricoides. When there is a too much inoculation of Ascaris lumbricoides in the human body, now imagine yung pasta ng spaghetti na hindi natunaw na nasa loob ng iyong intestinal tract blocks the passage of the uh, the bowel. No, kaya na laki yung chan. Edema. Bakit nagkakamaroon ng edema? Edema is uh, accumulation of fluid in the tissue. Okay. Enlargement of the major organ. Take note this, this guys. The major extraintestinal organ infected or being invaded by the parasite is liver. Okay. Skin lesions. In connection to elephantiasis, pwede din. No? Skin lesions. Yung mga site, site ng skin penetration. Okay. Site of the skin penetration. Example of skin lesions or example of parasite that can cause skin lesions is Dracunculus medinensis. Okay, the conculus medinensis. Blindness, loa loa. On concerta volvulus. Megleria foleri. Acantamiba. Can cause blindness. Okay, so these are the symptoms associated with parasitic infections. Now, you might wonder what's the difference between symptoms and signs? But like you, you always hear, hear that word signs and symptoms. When you said signs, this can be seen. When we said symptoms, this is being perceived by the patient. Ito yung nararamdaman niya. Okay? Now, we have what we call pre-patent period and auto-infection. What is the difference between pre-patent period and auto-infection? When we said pre-patent period, this is a biologic incubation period. This is no? Uh, this is a period between infection and the acquisition of the parasite. When we said auto-infection, it results when an infected individual becomes his own direct source of infection. Best example of auto-infection is enterobiasis or enterobius vermicularis. Take note of this, people of the Philippines. Auto-infection, okay? You are infected, and you are the reason why you become infected once again. Instead of eliminating the parasite itself, you is the reason. You are the one. No, kung bakit nagkamaroon ka na naman, or naging severe ang iyong infection. Like what I've said, enterobiosis. Enterobius vermicularis, also known as the pinworm, also known as the society worm, also known as the seat worm. No? It's the best example of auto-infection. Why? Uh, Scratching of the perianal region. Itching of the perianal, uh, perianal region. Perianal region. Will allow you to scratch the perianal region. No, kakamutin mo siya. Makati eh. Because of the enterobius. In, in, in Tagalog, ito yung ulay. No? So that you... Uh, can imagine. 
nakati siya. Kakamutin mo. Yung kamay na pinangkamot mo, hihahawak mo sa pagkain mo. The infection is being transmitted. You yourself becomes the mechanical vector. Okay? So that is auto-infection. Okay, how about super-infection and hyper-infection? Super, a uh, super, super-infection or hyper-infection. What does it mean? It is a type of exposure or, or infection wherein an infected individual is further infected to the same species leading to a massive infection. Example of which is strongyloides stercuralis. What is with strongyloides stercuralis? Ah, ito yung may pinatawag tayong super infection, rectal prolapse. What is this rectal prolapse? The intestine comes out of the perianal region. The large intestine, the anal, comes out and it resembles tomato. At para siyang chicharong bulaklak doon. Okay? Now, what are the sources of infection? What are the sources of infection? Uh, contaminated soil and water. San lack of sanitary toilet. Use of night soil or human excreta as fertilizer. Ano yung night soil? Hindi po itong lupang, lupang gabi. No? Pag sinabi natin light soil, ito yung mga matatawang lupa. We're in, no? ito yung mga compost soil. Bakit? We have what we call the soil transmitted parasite. Ayan, no? These are all soil transmitted parasites. Ascaris, Tricuris, Strongyloides, Hookworm. Hookworm is a general term for Necator Americanus and Ancylostoma duodenale. Soil transmitted yan. Sa fingernails mo, pumasok yung soil, night soil, with uh, human excreta or human feces. You eat, you forget to wash your hands. Then congratulations, you have the parasite in your body. Water no, can be a source of infection. What's my discussion? There's no safe food to eat. There's no safe liquid to drink. Everything that you eat, everything that you drink, can be a source of infection. Ingestion or uh, yeah, ingestion or consumption of contaminated water with the cyst of entamoeba histolytica or with the cyst of jargelambia can cost you uh, diarrhea. Consumption of contaminated food such as fish, crab, and snail. Well, snail, hindi naman siya ganun, tadal, hindi naman siya ganun laging kinakain. But snail can also be a source of infection. Fish that you love. Salmon that you uh, wish to eat. Crabs. No? Yung crabs, Paragonimus westermani. That's why in Don Sol Sorsogon, we're eating of raw or undercooked crabs is a delicacy. Pataas ang incidence dyan ng paragonomiasis. Paragonomiasis resembles tuberculosis. Akala ng tao, you have tuberculosis. But, but after submitting your sputum for AFB, there is no acid fast bacilli. Walang mycobacterium. Then the doctor must evaluate for further analysis. That's, that's what I said a while ago. No? Neglected. Ang una laging tinitingnan, ang una laging assumption, ang lag, una laging rule out ng mga doctors is what? Bacterial infections. If not bacterial infection, viral infection. You have cough, the doctor will tell you, the doctor will tell you, oh, you might have bacterial infection. You might have pneumonia. If the origin is that bacteria, you said you have a viral infection. 
But nowadays, you have cough, you have COVID, even though the origin is not viral. Fish. Example is heterophys heterophys of Historicus flaneus, no? uh, Clonorchis sinensis. Snail, yung mga trematodes, lahat yan, nagre-require ng snail as their intermediate host. And consumption of this contaminated snail or undercooked snail can cause the infection. Pork, but you love. The smell of the sangyup sal. Sangyup. No? Pork and beef. Undercooked. Some of you loves to eat raw or rarer, rarer, uh, what's the medium rare? I, I don't know if I if I remember it right. No, well done. Dapat well done. Kaso ayon ng well done, matigas daw. Dapat yung medyo juicy pa. But it can be source of an infection. Plants, no, and vegetables can also be a cause or source of infection. Ah, uh, fasciola, fasciolopsis. Arthropods being a vector or arthropods are uh, arthropods. No? It's an example where you can cause or where you can get an infection. Food handlers. That's why in parasitology, after taking this course, not like what one of my students said, you will be conscious enough in the food that you eat. Before you eat, you will imagine, you will think, is this food prepared well? Is the food handler handles the food properly? Okay. These are the sources of our infection. Okay. Another source of infection is what we call the auto-infection, which was discussed a while ago. Kanina, sabi ko lang sa inyo, Enterobius vermicularis is an example of auto-infection. Enterobiasis. Dagdagan natin ang ating kalaman about auto-infection. This parasite cache, Papillaria philippinensis, Enterobius vermicularis, Strongyloides stercuralis, and Hemenilapis nana, or nana, whatever you want to call it, can be a potential cause of auto-infection. Okay? Now, how can you acquire? We have what we call the modes of transmission. Ingestion is the most common. Skin penetration. Arthropods. Transmammary. Example of a parasite that can be transmitted through transmammary is or are strongyloides, stercuralis, and ancillostoma duodenale. Inhalation. Enterobius, pedes, inhalation. Sexual intercourse. Example, trichomonas vaginalis. Georgia lambia can also be transmitted through unprotected sexual intercourse. Okay? Now, like what I've said, it is important for you to remember the correct way of naming parasite, the nomenclature. When we said nomenclature, this is a systemic name or systemic way of naming. Okay? We use, we use or we follow the correct binomial system. Where in the genus, the first word must be capitalized. Or underline if written. Kung sulat ka may, must be an underline. The first letter must be an up in uppercase, and then the rest is in lowercase. Spacing, on the other hand, must be italized also or underlined. Italized kapag type written or kapag nakatype, and underlined kapag sulat ka may. Okay? And it must be low in lowercase. Example. Example is we have no uh, Ascaris lumbricoides. So it must be underlined kapag ikaw ay magsusulat. Now, if it is type written, Ascaris lumbricoides. Italize. Okay. So how about, sir, if in the LMS? So the first letter of the genus must be capitalized. Then the rest is lowercase. Okay. Now life cycle. Like what I've said, it is important to take note the life cycle. Now this is the process. No? 
the process of the development of the parasite. Remember, many parasitic organisms have but a single host being transferred from one individual to another of the same species without direct physical contact. This is the general pattern of the life cycle. Merong interaction ng parasite at ng host. Merong incubation, merong source in the infection. This is an example of the life cycle of Tenus saginata, the beef tapeworm. No? Penusad cycle, paulit-ulit lang yan. Okay? And each parasite has its own life cycle. And that will be discussed to you thoroughly as we go to our parasites. Okay? And of course, there will be a treatment. So part of Part of this lecture or part of our uh, discussion is the treatment. Antiparasitic medications is the most common. May bendazole, may albendazole, uh, metronidazole, aprasguantel. These are all parasitic infections. Chloroquine. Changing diet. You are fond of eating raw and undercooked pork. Lutu mo na siya ng husay. Fluid replacement. You are fond of drinking water from stagnant water. My God, what kind of people you are if you are drinking water from stagnant? Okay. Blood transfusion. If you have severe blood loss caused by the parasite. Bed rest is also important. Okay. Uh, prevention and control. Morbidity control. Avoidance of illness caused by infection. Information, education, communication. Adapt and maintain healthy life practices. Environmental management. Planning, organizing, performance, and monitoring of the infection control program, which you are going to formulate at the end of this course, at the end of the semester. And of course, environmental sanitation, disposal, and hygienic management. No? How to break the chain of infection back? In our PMLS class, we said the best way to break the chain of infection is through hand sanitation or hand hygiene. But how to break the chain of infection for the parasites? Number one, okay, let's have first the soil transmitted parasite. In order no, to prevent soil transmitted parasite, an preventive measure natin dyan? Hand wash, proper disposal of strita, okay? uh, provision of clean toilet, okay? personal protective equipment, or use of sleepers. That's a preventive measure to break the infection. Okay, don't you worry. I will give you a table for this so that uh, you will not Repeat and repeat what I am saying. Foodborne, hand washing, proper disposal of strita, proper cooking of the food is important. Vector borne, elimination of the vectors, protective clothing, uh, elimination of the mosquito, using mosquito net. Okay, contact transmitted, hygiene also. Sexually transmitted, Avoid unprotected intercourse. Or if better, avoid having an, an, uh, sexual intercourse. Okay. Again, I will give you, I will give you uh, a detailed, or a table, a summary of this. So that uh, you will not say, ano ba yung sinasabi niya? Okay. I will post in LMS. Part of the prevention and control program is the eradication and elimination. When we see, when we say, it, or when we say, this is eradication, permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of the infection. When we said, uh, this is elimination, this is basically reduction to zero of incident in specific geographic areas. Okay. So, 
we hope that time will come the disease eradication of COVID-19 will happen. And that is the end of the first part of our discussion about parasitology. Okay, the next part of that this, this discussion will be about the immunology of parasitic infection, how the parasite caused infection. Okay, so thank you and I hope that you will watch the second video.